And this is this is truly a great forum to to get these kind of conversations started, especially uh, within our our university group here. For our final participant today, I want to introduce Ms. Louise Miller. She is the chief procurement officer. I like saying that word because procurement is is just a fun thing in in higher education. Let me tell you, um, for the city of Medford. She is a 2005 Extension School graduate, uh, has an ALM, and uh, she serves as the Vice Chair of the Finance Committee for the Town of Needham, Massachusetts. And with that, I'll let you talk about social media as a tool, here we go, for achieving responsive government. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm actually going to continue the discussion that Ms. Noreen yeah. Mallory just started. <laughs> um, I'm also the budget director and personal director in the city of Medford, and so I'm very involved on in what local government can do and should be doing in response to um, social unrest. So black lives matter. In July 2012, George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch participant, was found not guilty after shooting Trayvon Martin, a young man visiting in the community. Black Lives Matter was founded as, quote, a call to action for black people after George Zimmerman was not held accountable for the crime he committed. It was a response to the anti-black racism that permeates our society and also, unfortunately, our movements, end quote. One of the founders goes on to state that, quote, Black Lives Matter is an ideological and political intervention in a world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise, end quote. There is a real problem in this country when people feel that they are targeted and that they are oppressed to the point of death. Two years later, Michael Brown is shot by a police officer. Brown is unarmed. This occurs in a neighborhood in the middle of the day. Over 100 witnesses are interviewed by the police to determine what happened. For a little over two weeks after Brown's death, demonstrations in Ferguson result in many arrests, some injuries and devastating property damage. Some businesses never recover. Thousands came from all over the country to demonstrate. The media and social media had started relaying partial and misleading information. Focus was on the race of the police officer, white, and the race of the deceased, black. The government failed to respond. Government had complete control following Michael Brown's death. Immediately, the police failed. They left the body lying in the street for hours without any kind of privacy shield before investigators arrived. The body, as we were told before, was not removed until four hours after his death. In the meantime, a crowd had gathered and people were getting angry as they spread information about what they thought happened. The media, always interested in a good story, followed and repeated any information. Government did nothing to defuse the situation. Instead, in response to a direct question, they refused to share any information about the officer involved. They refused to commit to a time when the autopsy would be completed. A few days later, the police released a videotape of Brown immediately prior to his being stopped by the police stealing some items from a convenience store and shoving a worker there. The media republished it. The release inflamed the demonstrators who now felt that the police was setting up a character claim against Brown. The, gov whoops, sorry. the government should have been ready to address the media immediately. They could have stated the undisputed facts. There was an incident at the convenience store. Michael Brown and his friend were walking in the middle of the street. There was an altercation and Michael Brown was shot dead. They should have explained the delay in the arrival of the investigators. They could have responded with what the normal operating procedure is in the event of a death at the hand of a police officer. They could have reassured the public that the death of an unarmed young man would be fully investigated and that the results would be fully shared. They could have asked the local residents and should have asked the local residents 
to help them maintain calm in the city. Would this have worked? Maybe. Maybe not. But it would have been an effort on the part of government to reach out to the people rather than just simply set up barriers and barricades. Black Lives Matter grew in the wake of Brown's death. One of the founders states that Black Lives Matter aims to free black lives from state violence. She states that, quote, black people are deprived of our basic human rights and dignity. She addresses such issues as black poverty and the numbers of black people in jail. She speaks of white supremacy. In the face of these statements, what can and should government do? We need to find our national compass, and we need to return to basic principles of what we as Americans want and expect from government. Just across the river, on March 5, 1770, the Boston Massacre took place. A restless crowd of colonists began pelting British soldiers with snowballs, oyster shells, and trash. With their backs against the wall, the soldiers opened fire and killed five colonists and wounded six more. Future United States President John Adams defended the British soldiers who were charged with murder and threatened to be hanged. Sam Adams, John Adams' cousin and one of the leading revolutionaries, took advantage of the incident to inflame the people against the British. Sam Adams used the earlier day form of social media, leaflets, public speeches, and private chats under the Liberty Tree. John Adams, however, in his closing argument to the jurors, laid the foundations for the principles of American government. Defending the British soldiers was not popular, but he believed in the rule of law. Adams argued that the power of law does not bend to the desires of men, but must uphold that which is good and punish that which is evil. He set forth the principle that is the law, void of passion, that governs and determines the course of justice. Six of the soldiers were found not guilty, and only two convicted were lightly punished. Adams later recalled this as one of the best pieces of service he ever rendered to his country. Notwithstanding the raucous, popular clamor for freedom from tyranny, Adams understood and concluded that gang behavior, intimidation, and bullying will not be condoned and cannot be used to foster or justify further violence. He famously articulated the goal of a government of laws, not of men. The very foundation of the duty of government is stated in the Declaration of Independence in order to form a more perfect union. The American government would recognize all men as created equal and would recognize that all men were entitled to the pursuit of happiness. 50 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of his most famous speeches. Quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character, end quote. Dr. King's speech challenged American society to look beyond superficial distinction. His dream was a dream that all people share, to be judged on who they really are, what they stand for, and what they have actually accomplished. Fifty years after Dr. King's speech, we have made progress by becoming aware of our prejudices. We celebrate diversity. However, the very act of pointing out race draws attention precisely to a superficial characteristic that bears no meaning on an individual's value as a human being. If we are ever to get closer to truly judging each person on their character, we must first stop defining ourselves based on these superficial differences. We must eliminate the barriers that we place between ourselves and others, and we must look at each person and see a fellow human being to be measured as we measure ourselves based on what is good and just. Only then will we have achieved the freedom and integration of all equally into our society. Still, there is an underlying problem here in the United States today. Many black people have no confidence in the racial neutrality of their government. Governmental response in Ferguson only fanned the flames. Government ignored the media, ignored social media completely. 
The Ferguson government should have had a web page with information on process and procedure, had a Facebook page which could have been interactive. Twitter, just as easily as one can organize a demonstration, one can organize a meeting with the community to discuss what happened and hear concerns. If we look at the role of government, whether local, state, or federal, government must provide for the safety of its own citizens. Government must also provide for the education of the children in each community. The education needed for the children to thrive and be able to pursue their own dreams. Government relies on citizen involvement. Otherwise, government does not know what services to provide or at what level. It does not know the issues that need to be addressed. If there's no citizen involvement, then government needs to seek it out. Citizens who are not involved cannot expect responses. Demonstrations in Ferguson were meant to reach the highest level and did reach the highest levels. Organizations like Black Lives Matter state problems that apply across America, but they only state problems. They do not propose solutions. What Ferguson teaches us is that, whoops, is that we need to achieve democratic balance in government. Government at each level must focus on the services it is supposed to provide. I sat in Harvard Yard on commencement day in June 2005. That day, I had an epiphany. As I sat, I realized that the point of education is for everyone to have the opportunity to be right where I was. That doesn't mean everyone will get there, only that everyone has the chance to get there, that there won't be insurmountable blocks along the way. Black Lives Matter tell us that some people perceive that they are targeted for failure and oppression by the government, that they are treated differently because of their race. Government must seek out citizen involvement of all its citizen and encourage them so that it can become responsive. With Ferguson, there were some underlying issues that the government needed to address immediately. There was racial tension in the community between the police department and the residents. First, the government should have investigated and redressed any wrongdoing. Second, the government should have engaged in a continuous conversation with its citizens. Communication has become easier and more direct in the age of social media. Government should adapt and respond. Finally, government should uphold the rule of law. Our country has always been a leader in protecting human rights and promoting civil rights. In order to achieve, protect, and defend these critical rights, we as a people must continue to support and promote civility, humanity, and justice, always being guided by a compass that tells us what is fair and what is right. And I will conclude with more words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Thank you. Who's up with some questions? Start back there. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up here uh, in terms of dehumanization in relationship to our president, because going back nine years ago during the election and substantially uh, uh, later both elections, there have been symbolic and iconic dehumanization of the president for being black. And this has been all over social media, et cetera. You know, you've all seen and heard the monkeys, the, the big afros, all of that horrific stuff. Do you feel in any way that that kind of ideology, that scary, sad ideology that's coming out, is in any way relation, related to a lot of what we've been seeing, including all of these cases between you and Miss Mallory speaking, in terms of a rising up of uh, black hatred black lives not mattering, et cetera. I mean, is there an element of our president being black that's causing a problem for a lot of people and connected to all of this? Because I, I think that that's, that's an important thing, and it's very sad to see, you know, I live in Chicago now, and we had a lot of problems with people using iconology and symbology against the president purely based on his race. Oh, I don't need to go to the no. microphone. No. <laughs> um, I actually do think that having a black president president did 
bring up to the surface what might have been otherwise, you know, below the surface racist feelings. And one of the problems is that with social media, instantaneously, that gets disseminated. And so I think that what you end up having or the impression of something that may be more prevalent than it really is because it gets disseminated. Some people think it's funny. Some people think it's true. And um, I, do, I do think it, it is an issue. And I do think that it is because we have a black president that some of these issues are rising to the surface. Do you think hiring more black police officers would would help? You know, I actually work in local government, and my answer to that is no. I don't think that black police officers are any different from white police officers. It's a police, and it's a police issue, and the way in which police address different segments of the population. And um, I was speaking earlier with Noreen and her friend. And um, we actually, there are things that local government can do without looking at race. Um, so for instance, right now, what we're looking at is response time in the different sectors in the city to see whether there are differences in response time. And if there are, then what is the reason for the difference? And make everyone aware of what it is that they are actually doing. A lot of it is a lack of awareness. They don't you know, it's their underlying prejudices, not surface prejudices. Next question. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned uh, response time. Uh, the city of Newark, New Jersey, which is predominantly black, they uh, banned police chases that are so popular in the movies nowadays because uh, <laughs> civilians were getting killed. And they mm -hmm. said, we're not going to do that. I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, with the police with these guns, that's very old technology. Is there anything that government can do to bring high-resolution cameras to somebody who's unarmed and have a, res a response to that uh, if, if the, there's life? Is there anything that you can think Possibly. of? Possibly. The problem, though, for police officers is that every time they go out on the street, they don't know whether the person who they're going to stop has a firearm. And that's, you know, that's part of the problem. They have to be armed for their own protection. I also think another problem, truthfully, is cuts in budget. Police officers are now drive around alone or walk around alone. I think that the likelihood of them, the police officer feeling unsafe or overreacting goes up hugely if they're alone rather than with someone else. So, I mean, some of these issues are money issues, um, but if there's a technology where from a distance I can stun you, that would be great. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I'm living in Korea now, so this feels like a whole different world for me now. <laughs> um, but if you look in a program, I graduated in 1989. Two weeks before, I was stopped by a police officer along with my brother. There had been an armed robbery in Brookline, and they, we fit the description. Mm -hmm. Until they called in, turned out to be two black males, so we both said, okay, we're out. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but the thing is, it seems like there are two different conversations as I look at this from Korea. That there's one conversation, as, as the two you're focusing on, about the role of the police. But there's a different conversation, and that is, don't run. Mm -hmm. And it seems that people in America are having trouble having these two conversations at the same time and they end up talking past each other so that they're not gonna to listen to each other. Um, okay, Nathan Glazer was my advisor, School of Education. He talked about how when people look at American history, you can point out the Indians and blacks and all the terrible things that happened, but you can also point out all the great things that happened, but there are these two conversations that just pass each other. Um, best case scenario, if you got what you wanted, and I'd also ask Ms. Mallory, what would happen? Best case scenario. And I ask that because in 1899, W.B. Du Bois wrote the book, The Philadelphia Negro. Mm. And he said that if racism ended tonight or ended mm. tomorrow, that the condition of most black people would not change because they lack skills, they lack education, they lack morality, and a long list of things. So best case scenario, if you got what you wanted, what would happen? 
a realistic way. And I would, yeah, I wish you could also. Yeah. Well, first of all, to, to not be, I mean, to, uh, I have to try to condense this, but for, for black people, myself included, I could go down a list of experiences that I, a person with no criminal record, of my in interactions with police officers based on my presumed criminality, my presumed interaction with something that's not uh, legal. It's, it's the presumptions that we always are walking under. If police officers or, or other people, if we wanted to see something change, then you have to deal with people on an individual basis based upon their actions and not the presumption of who you think they are. That's that's why I focus on the dehumanization. Okay. I, I want to make sure that you both get a chance to answer. Yeah, right, so and okay. for me, I mean, I think where I'd want to see more time spent and more funds and better programs would be in education. And by education, I don't just mean, you know, the school systems, which I think all need um, to be improved, but also education of government and government officials. I mean, police are part of government, and they need a lot more education as well. Um, police academy is very, very short, and then we put them in a uniform and turn them over alone on the street. Okay. That it seems like people think that all police are trained equally and they're not. That's like a per town, per city, per, mm -hmm. you know, your state funding programs, which can be extremely limited or extremely amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I live in a totally dominant white culture, white town, um, that we have everything you could possibly want in a police force. But still the difference between how my, I teach my children, my sons, how to react to police involvement versus how... You know, my daughter's fiance is black and how he has to deal with it is two completely different things. So for people to say it's not everywhere. And I think it's a socioeconomic issue too, but my question to you is, why is this not, or is this a civic case? Like, clearly their civil rights are being violated as, an, as a citizen and a human being. It angers me that, that, that there's this blatant of a civil rights violation to any of us. Why are more people not angry that our rights are being violated and nothing seems to be, there should be a class action suit against this across the board. And I think the problem with that is, what's the end result of that? Money, a declaration, a statement. I think that there is no end result to that particular um, course of action. If, if, if I'm being real, not. yeah, realistically, yeah. All it does is it just provides more information, but there already is information, it doesn't, we don't get anything more than that from it. I just think if we don't protect our civil rights, we lose them eventually as we've seen them dwindle away over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. I think it's crazy to not take action. That's just me. And speaking of action, I'm gonna have to take an action Thank right you. now. Thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna wrap up, okay.